don't have any. So here we are. Welcome to the bookmark on a beautiful Florida night. And um, we're very excited to have Steve Barry and Elizabeth here tonight. Um, it's not the same. We were just talking about it was a year ago almost to the day that um, Steve and Elizabeth were our last event that we did live before everything started shutting down for COVID. But um, we're happy to see their smiling faces. And this is the 16th Cotton Malone. It is. That we're getting into the Kaiser's Web. And it's really the secret of, you know, what happened in that bunker? Did, did somebody escape? Did Hitler escape or Ava Braun or one of their consorts escape and walk off with the Nazi gold? And, you know, <laughs> he knows, but he's not going to tell you tonight. I have a feeling you're going to have to read the book. But as you know, always there's great history in there because we're, you know, Steve and Elizabeth are the queen and king of the history research to figure out what happened. So you'll learn something along the way in spite of yourself. And it has a, you know, a current uh, part to it as well, because it could affect the election of the German chancellor. So you get a good mystery and some good uh, history along the way. And I'm going to shut up because you didn't come to see me. You came to see Steve. So thank you guys for coming and we'll turn it over to you. Hello. We were just whispering here back and forth. <laughs> and last minute instructions here. We have to modify this presentation a little bit because you guys have heard us talk so many, so times. many times. And so you know all the stories. So we don't really, uh, there's a lot of them. We, we'll have to modify, see yeah. if we can get some new stuff here right. uh, for, the, for, the, for the old pros here. This is my 20th novel, which means I've been to the bookmark 20 times, yeah. you know, because I went with every single book to the bookmark. So yeah. this is uh, sort of a, a milestone, the 16th Cotton Malone. Y'all are the, the the last event as usual. You always are our last event. At the end. We've done uh, uh, nine other of these events over the last two weeks. Virtual touring is the way of the world right now and might even be the wave of the future you might be looking at here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming to you live from my new office in uh, in. Orlando, Florida. Yeah. And I know she's poking me in the back. See, she y'all don't see this, but she pokes me in <laughs> the not, back when she says, shut up, shut up, shut up. Quit. You're going I'm to not doing it. There you are. So you're, shut up. I'm doing you're it poking me. Normally I'm in the audience with all of you when we do this event. So you might be wondering why am I um why on, are you here? On the camera. Shut up. Why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> because Steve has done so many of these virtual events and he figured out very early on after the first or second one that it's kind of weird and lonely to just stare at that green dot right there. The little green dot doesn't blink. It doesn't yeah. move. It just looks at you the whole time. It's really unnerving. Right. That little green dot. So, so he had me come on. So I'm going to ask him some questions and just to give him a human being to interact with a little bit. Even though you're all there, we can't see you like we normally see you when we're mm -hmm. at the beach with you. Um, so we'll get right into it. Get into it. Let me poke you. Okay, okay, okay. He's normally so professional. We come to the bookmark and now he's like, we're back, we're back home. We're we, home. We haven't, we haven't roamed around. We're back I know. home. I love it so much. We miss you guys a lot. Um, so let's talk about this book. Interesting about this book, even though you wrote it before the pandemic, mm -hmm. it, it, this is the pandemic has taken a huge kind of, um, I don't know. It's, it's put it in a different light. It's caused us to act differently. It's caused us to tour differently. But going back to when you started writing the book, you discovered the story a little weird <laughs> compared to normally we go to a place and you're researching or whatever. You were actually in Jacksonville when I you know, discovered the story. On my Facebook fan page today, we put up a, a post up about the Chamblin book mine and we put a bunch of photographs up there. So if you, none of you, ever, if you've never been to the book mine, look at those pictures and you're, you're going to see what I'm about to tell you. On Roosevelt. That, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of books at the Chamblin book mine and th those pictures are just shows you how many books there are there. And I do all my research there. And even though we now live uh, three hours away, I'm uh, still going to go back every once in a while and still do the research there. I was researching another novel and had nothing to do with anything about World War II or whatever. And I was in the book mine and a book caught my eye up on the shelf. And I just pulled it off, started thumbing through it. I came across something that happened in the, the latter part of 1944 that I never had heard of before. I said that I've actually never heard of that. So what, what is that? And I looked at it, I looked into it some more and sure enough, it was true and real. And the Kaiser's web uh, started to uh, sort of swirl around in my brain. Um, this book deals with uh, 
as Rana said, the election of a new German chancellor. And it, all of that is going to revolve around some secrets that the two candidates know about each other. And one, and some of those secrets go back to 1945 and the night of April 30th and what happened in the Fuhrer bunker underneath Berlin. Now, this is not a novel about Hitler surviving the war and the Fourth Reich taking over and doing all kinds of things. It's not, and that's, that's not what this book's about. In the novel, Hitler is dead. He, he died in the bunker. It is a novel about someone else who was in the bunker that night, someone who did leave the bunker the next day and who was never officially heard or seen from ever again. And that's Martin Borman. And Borman is the guy who put in place the thing I found in late 1944. And it, the novel began to kind of gel together at that point. These two candidates know these secrets. Cotton and Cassiopeia get caught up in their civil war as they're trying each to become the next chancellor of Germany. Uh, it takes them from Germany to South America, which is where I've been wanting to send cotton for a long time, to the Chilean Lake District and over into Argentina and then over to South Africa, another place I've been wanting to send him, then up to Austria, Switzerland, and back to Germany. So there's some new locales and some new exciting things. For all of us who are locked down and can't travel, we're gonna get a good run of, of, of the world with this novel here. It is a timely novel. I've been getting, a lot of the reviews have been saying, wow, this is just right on point with what's been happening lately. Um, interestingly though, I wrote the novel two years ago. Uh, the novel was turned in in January of 2020. Uh, written in late 18 going into 19. So the novel was, is, is, you know, so all of those things were written a long time ago and they actually did turn out to be quite prophetic of some of the things that are in there. It deals with the rise of the new right in Europe, which is happening over and over and it's becoming more and more problematic and the somewhat weakening and demise of the European Union and all how all that's gonna figure in into a growing uh, Germany and what will happen with these two candidates wanting to be the next chancellor. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a good, timely story romping around the, 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 the world, uh, one I think you're going to enjoy. She, so, poked, she poked me I'm again. Poking, I, she poked I just me moved. again. She did it. <laughs> so we didn't actually, even though it wasn't during the pandemic, like I said, we did not actually travel to all of these places. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few reasons why. And... So of the places we've we've been to Germany, we've been to Switzerland. Um, Germany and Switzerland, we pretty much covered yeah, right. uh, South Africa and, never, and South America. We, we were so, we were, were supposed, supposed to, to supposed yeah. to go to South America, but we couldn't. We'll we'll go. We'll get there. We'll go back and, and do it. You don't have to go to a place to write about it. You don't. It helps, but you don't have to. I talked to people who have been there, people who have lived there. And then I did the research in the books. And so, you know, you're going to get a pretty accurate. I had some folks look it over and they said I, I had it pretty good uh, as far as both places go. So you're going to learn a lot about the Chilean Lake District. A lot of Germans immigrated to there after World War II, and it was not by accident. There was a reason why those Germans went there. Not all of them were going to escape being prosecuted as war criminals. There were a lot of war criminals were found there. There's a more to the story than that. And South, um, South Africa largely escaped the war, but it became a refuge afterwards for a lot of folks. So it's an interesting, interesting locale, some good history here that I think you're going to enjoy. So central to the, to the story, obviously, is always Cotton Malone, uh, your hero, for those of you who have not read Steve before, and his girlfriend, Cassiopeia, is in the book. So who could that be? So for yeah. those, for, again, for those of you who don't know, yeah. Cotton Malone is Steve Barry. Nah. Um, he acts like him. He talks like him. Steve doesn't fly planes and, you know, jump out of planes and whatever, but Cotton is him. And Cassiopeia is me. Is. <laughs> and is I you. love her. She's amazing. It is you. Um, I don't do some of the really amazing hero kind of things that she does, but her, her personality is very much mine. And mm -hmm. Steve has put actual conversations we've had in the books. He's put actual fights mm -hmm. we've had in the books, which I don't appreciate. They worked really well. Uh, it's fine. But you did something <laughs> different in this book than you have in any other book mm -hmm. but with their relationship. Yeah. So tell everyone what you did. Well, every novel, every Cotton Malone novel, I explore some aspect of Cotton's personality that I've never 
explored before. And that's what makes each one a little bit unique to that character because I'm doing something I've never, I'm delving into an aspect of him that I've never looked at before. This one, I decided to delve into the aspect of him and Cassiopeia working together as a team, not fighting, not fussing, not in conflict, but as a loving couple, trusting each other, relying on each other and, and, and working together. At one point, Cassiopeia goes here, he goes here, they come back together. They both save each other's butts more than once. There, there is a lot of going, a lot of back and forth going on, and it was fun to, to work them as a as a team, and and how things you know work out as a team. And you say I do arguments and all, but that's how we work. So I, true. so I, I took I took some of the good aspects of it and oh, put it in there. Now you so get the brownie points. I'm trying, and yeah. so she won't poke me again. Right. Poke me. Poke me. Um, okay, so let's talk about the research. This is actually really interesting because we go to the bookmark every year you guys never really get to see into steve's office and yeah we're so here we're here so we thought we'll um, show you a couple for things. you we're, we'll show you around let me a duck bit. see all that right there back there that okay. is the uh european uh travel guides and, and uh, european when i go to a castle mm -hmm. i tour the castle i go downstairs to the bookshop that's the first thing i say to her is where's the bookshop mm -hmm. we find the bookshop we buy everything in english yeah. that's there and that's what that's back here on these shelves arranged by country. Right, right. So it's like France. Everything we've done in France, everywhere we've researched, all the oh, travel guides, right. all the castle guides, all the everything. About 3,000 yeah, or so, so like France, pamphlets over Poland, there. Poland, Germany, everything. All there. All, all right there. there. Then over here are my 19th and early 20th century travel guides mm -hmm. that I use all the time. Uh, because things in Europe don't change. They, they, you know, they, the descriptions, the look, the colors, it's pretty much right. all the so same. These are really cool back here. Let me show you guys. Uh, and then over in the far corner of those shelves oh, over there, point, over right, right over in there, are the books I'm using right now to work to, for the novel I'm writing right now. I can only keep about 100 at a time on the shelf, but I use about 400. So I cycle them in and out. Yeah. from boxes or whatever. Wait, tell me about these. These are the old Bodecker's travel guides. This was like the travel channel of the late 19th, early 20th century. This is so cool. So in here, it's it's all the the details and there's little maps that you can unfold. They had everything it's, in there. And I mean, this is like- When you went on a trip, this is, this is one of- uh, yeah. Northern, uh, Southern France. When you went to Southern yeah. France, you'd buy your Bodeckers, you take it with you, right. and this would be your, it's your just, guide. It's so beautiful, and there's so much in there. Look at that. Literally, it's, literally the travel channel of that yeah. time. And it's all, you know, annotated, really cool. And this is I've what? collected about a dozen of those. They're hard to find. They're, they're not hard. So they're, cool. Bodeckers is still around, but these are so, the, some this of the really what, old like stuff. 1880 or something like that? I don't know. Let's see how 19. old that one is. That's a good question. You can never know how uh, you have to look up here in the front here. Let's see. We haven't done this yet. Sorry. I, I haven't done. Oh, 1902. 1902. 1902, that book was published. Yeah. So cool. uh, I have about a dozen of those. And then if you see that globe right there over my shoulder. I'll um, go that's one of those globes, you know, that has like a bar inside it that you keep drinks in there. I took all the guts out and you can see she opened it and inside are all my maps. I keep maps. There's probably, I don't know, a couple, yes. two, three hundred maps in there. There's uh, like stacks and stacks. And they're arranged maps. by region. Uh, I love Mich Michelin maps are really good. There's I like old fashioned maps. I don't use the Internet much for maps. I use actual real maps to do measuring and everything that, that I look for. So I keep them all right there where, where it's handy. So this is sort of where I work every day. So I come in here and I spend six hours at least, sometimes eight you know, I spend in here. Uh, oh, let me show you something else. Oh, wait a minute. oh she's, something occurred to her. Here she goes. Okay. She loves to bring this, this over. I love this box. This is a, when I, when, let me tell, let me give them the background. When I do, the the, when I do the research and I go through the 400 books, I make notes. On a legal pad. Uh, just write them out. I write out longhand and then she's going to show you. Here they come. Okay. So in this box, oh, our this, notes. This is a book. She's very strong. Oh, that's so heavy. She's very strong. <laughs> so what he does is, I mean, there's just like stacks. There's probably it's 30, about it's like that 30 tall. stacks. It's like about this. that tall. Yeah. yeah. It's about maybe a foot tall. Right. So. Mm -hmm. He just writes down his research notes. And then when he goes through and writes the book, he puts a line through everything he's used. And you guys, there's thousands of pages in here. 
you know, it's anything from those. I'm only going to use, I've told you this before, I'm only going to use 20% of like these. Like here's notes. the little legal pads that he uses. I use whatever paper I can find because I'm going to throw all these away when I'm done. Which so is I, so I try to recycle paper as much as I can. Yeah. And like this, what was this? This was, oh, when we were on the Steve Barry and Fan Strip in Margaritaville, something occurred to him. So he just wrote it on the hotel stationary mm -hmm. and threw it in here. So, so but this is a whole book. All these That's where I keep everything there where they're handy. And as I'm writing the novel, that's why I write them down longhand because I can remember better. I'm better than typing them out. So I would just, something occurred to me, said, whoa, there, I remember that. I had that and I go, I have it arranged by subject matter. I can find it and I can insert it to the book. So I said, only about 20% of that's going to be used. 80% is not going to go, but I have no idea what that 20% is going to be until <laughs> I'm writing the book. So I, I write everything down. And then when it's over, I toss them. I toss them in the garbage and start over again. It's so depressing that you do. No, it's, uh, <laughs> what am I going to do with all that stuff? I don't know. It's, I, don't, I don't think they're going to have a Steve Berry archive somewhere. Well, they right? actually do have a Steve Berry archive at Brown University, and you've never sent them anything because I throw everything away. Exactly. <laughs> Which is a little ironic for someone who has history matters. Yeah, we have a foundation <laughs> called History it's Matters. Matter. It matter. But it's just <laughs> a lot of paper. Most of that stuff would be unknown to anybody. I have a little shorthand that I use. Unless you know what I use, you're not going to understand. A, most of it. And so it just, it's only valuable to me. All right. So I think a lot of um, you guys know about the Steve Barry and fans trip, but just to make sure you do, we want to tell you about the one we kept coming up because it's been postponed twice. And this is the one to pull in for the Warsaw protocol. So you can tell about Krakow. We put it off now to May of 22. Uh, so uh, we're hoping everything would be open up by then. The countries will be open back up. Things will be settled down. Most of the world will be vaccinated. We hope so. We're going to you know, see how it goes as we get later this year, but it looks like we'll be okay there. Uh, we're going to go to Krakow and we're going to go to Bobo Castle and see all the scenes for there. We're going to go to Chesnakova and we're going to see everything that happens there. And then we're going to go to the salt mines and see everything there. It's everything that goes on there. Not, and what we do is we take fans around and we show you how we put the novel together, how we assembled it, how it was put together. It's a seven day trip. Uh, right now, uh, we've got about 51, 52. We've got room for about four or five more, I'm told. And then, because we only do one bus, whatever can go into one bus, and that's all. And we're staying at the Sheraton there in Krakow, which is a beautiful hotel. If you want to come with, along with us, you can go to my website, stevebear.org, under the events, and you'll see a link there to author fan travel. We don't, I'm not pitching this, we don't make any money for this. We donate our time and we go over there for that week. So this has nothing to do with us monetarily. Uh, it does have to do with us getting to know the fans and interacting with them. And uh, so you, if, you, if you're interested, you ought to get in touch with them pretty soon because there, as I said, there's only a few slot, slots left. Then we're going to cut it off and it'll go to a waiting list. Right. Oh, oh I just ended that very I was done. <laughs> um, okay. So What's next? also something that you guys might not know about is Steve has recently changed publisher. So this is our last book with, uh, McMillan. They may not know this though, because we, we didn't do this when we were there last time. It All happened right. after. Okay. Um, so the Kaiser's web is the last book that we're doing with McMillan who mm -hmm. we love. There's an incredible publisher. We love them. They're wonderful. Um, but, uh, I had an opportunity to, to move over yeah. to grand central, uh, with his yet and I'll be moving there next year. Next year, Cotton's going to take a year off and I'm doing a standalone novel with a new character. Uh, a guy who works for the United Nations. He's been in my head for a long time and I've been wanting to, to bring him to life. And it's, uh, they offered the opportunity and I said, let's, let's do it. Uh, same kind of stuff though, action, history, secrets, conspiracies, uh, new character though, new motivations, new everything. And the book will deal with the most stolen and vandalized piece of art in history. And I'm going to let you figure out what that is. I'm not going to tell you, but it will be dealing with that and some very interesting things uh, that uh, I've been wanting to, to, to put together. It's called the 12th panel. Then Cotton will be back in 2023 and 24. So he returns then. And then something else is happening. I'm going to be bringing Luke Daniels to his own series, which will start in 23, 24, and 25. The great uh, thriller writer Grant Blackwood is going to write those with me. So Luke's getting his own. It'll be a little more Cussler-like, a little more action adventure, but still history, still all the things are there, but a little more like like Cussler because Luke, Luke deserves that. And you know, a little more action. Those of you who don't know, she 
it was her she created him he kind of came came from her i did so uh, she's is he she he, I did. he calls his mama every sunday his I, brothers are matthew mark and john of course and uh of yeah course. he's he's about 10 years younger than cotton about no, that about 15 years. about 15 about 15 years, years yeah, because yeah, yeah. the new character is about 10 years, 10 years younger, younger than cotton. Yeah. yeah so it gives us a little more um leeway a uh, little more fun to have with him and uh, we're writing that book right now and as i said that will be published in 23 and 24 and 25 so a lot coming over the next few years definitely and um i think we're gonna take questions let's go ahead and take some now. questions yeah, let, now you guys always have questions rana what you got okay yeah i'll come back on um the first one is from Carl. He says, hi, Steve. I remember when you were in our writer's workshop with Frank Green and Clyde Rogers. How much did that help you become a successful writer? I would I would not be a writer, but for that workshop. I would not even be here, but for that workshop. That was back in the uh, mid 90s uh, when Clyde was still alive. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be here. I mean, the- you dedicated a book? The entire I dedicate an entire book to all those folks. Yeah. So they they have an entire novel dedicated to them. I learned to write in a critical process, and I, I as I say all the time, no one can teach anyone how to write. It's impossible. But there are people that can help you teach yourself how to write, and that's what those folks were for me. They helped me learn how to teach me how to write. And I've I've said it over and over again. I would not be where I am right now, but for the writers' workshop and all the things that I was able to assimilate out of that, and then put together and create my own style from it. So I'm eternally grateful to all those folks. And as I said, they had a novel dedicated to all of them. That just not Clyde and um, Frank, but my writers' group too. With you know the, the you know that I talked to you about before. Uh, many times, all of them were were also in that. Yeah, you have a lot of hellos that I'll you know put in between here. Um, Shelly from Jacksonville, she misses you both. Wish you were here in person. Um, I don't know who this is up top. Says my name. My mama Karen lives in Folkestone now, and wanted to say hello to you both to tell you that she misses you. And a lot of so excited. Oh, that's from Debbie and Ken. So excited that Luke is getting his own series finally. So there's that going on. People need to send in more questions. But then there's a question about, um, so you're getting a new publisher. So when does that mean your book will come out next year? It'll be out right now. Tentatively, the second week of June is where it's looking at right now. That's the date I have. Uh, that can shift around a week or two, depending on the competition. You try to find a week where you don't have, you know, a, three Jim Patterson books, a Cussler book, you know, and, uh, you know, the next Bridgerton novel. And, and, and of course, Sarah Moss will write something else by then, surely. You know, and, right. and the whole thing is, you know, you try to find a week where you can, uh, you know, have a little bit of a run, but it's hard that time of year. Summer is a really busy time. I'm liking it being a summer book, though. I, I miss being a summer book. I haven't been a summer book since 2005. So I've done every uh, I've done every part of the year. I've been January, February, March, April, May, June. I've not done July or August, but I've done September, November. You've done July and August with your novellas. I've done novellas and yeah, I'm talking about novels, the actual novels. Uh, probably July and August are the only two months I've not debuted a hardback novel every other. I like all of them. Uh, I prefer not to be Christmas again. I enjoy being Christmas, but Christmas is murder. <laughs> Just murder because a lot of people buy books, but there's a, all the big boys are there, all of them. So they're going to put me into June next year and we're going to, we're going to see how, how, what summer goes with me. You talked about how the pandemic has affected touring and certainly, you know, nobody's coming out in person. It's not safe yet for any of that to happen. And we don't know what the future will look like in that way. How does it affect this question of, you know, getting on the New York Times bestseller list and when you put a book out? Because I know, sadly, a number of books last year just came out in the, you know, great black hole of, uh, you know, May, June, July, <laughs> when when stores weren't open to sell them. Yeah, it, it, well, that caught everyone off guard last year. But the end result was book sales were up dramatically last year. Uh, and they're up dramatically this year. Uh, every category, uh, adult fiction's up 26% this year. So everything is up. I mean, 
uh, people are buying, and interestingly, they're buying hardcover books. <laughs> they're buying actual physical books, which is interesting. Those those numbers have gone up, you know, quite a bit. So the pandemic is a horrible thing, but it, from a reading standpoint, it was a stimulus and it helped a lot. Now, for like for yourself, you know, you need customers, you need people coming in and, and doing things. But it it from an overall standpoint, publishers have had a very good 2020, and 2021 is looking pretty good too. Well, I mean, it's a great time to read. You know, there's only yeah. so much. Exactly. Time. Watch it without losing your mind. Um, <laughs> uh, question is, what's the name of your new character for next year? His name is Nicholas Lee, is his name. Nicholas Lee and uh, Nick Lee, uh, which is the name of the, uh, the the gentleman who built this house. Oh, yeah, because what's <laughs> also happened during the pandemic is we built a house and we moved. <laughs> so that's been a little crazy. So as we well. moved to Orlando and uh, Nick was in... Uh, yeah, his father is his father owns the company, but Nick runs it. It's like the on-site supervisor. He runs everything. So Nick Nick built this house. So uh, I asked him his name, and he gave it to me. And uh, now the the man who owns the company, Derek, is in the 2023 novel. In fact, a lot of the people who worked on this house are all in the 2023 novel. There's a whole bunch of them in there that that did a lot of work here. I bet they're thrilled. They are. They were very nice. They did a great job on this thing. You know, they just worked really hard. We, you know, building a house is tough, but building a house in a pandemic is just, it just, it was a lot of challenges in there. And they just stuck with it all the way and uh, and got it done, which is just amazing. So I made them all characters. Some die, some don't, you know, they, they really went out. <laughs> And, uh, I sure they, I'd want to be a character that you killed off, but you know it'd be nice to be nice. Don't you know? It's just the way it is. <laughs> Life, right? right. <laughs> so, how does this book play in Germany? Well, that's a good question. We'll see how it goes. I have a German publisher who's bought every one of my novels, so we'll see. I don't think they bought it yet. Uh, it's been bought in several overseas: England, France. Poland, Italy, uh, some of the major markets have already bought it. I don't know if Germany's got it yet or not, but they will. They'll buy them all. They usually buy them all. Uh, you know, this is not a negative book on Germany. I love the country. I love everything about it. It's just a reflection of there's two sides to this position. There's two sides going on over there. And they're actually there right now. And they actually are buying against one another. So it's about, it's about that in some degree and looking at it. But again, uh, I, I've gotten some negative reviews on Amazon and other places claiming this is some kind of parody of American politics. I, this has nothing to do with American politics. It's entirely German politics, completely German in, in every way. And uh, and please remember, I wrote it two years ago. <laughs> you know, they was, they forget the delay, you know, yeah, and all of this. Yeah, I wrote it long before there was an election last year and long before anything else happened. You know, that book was long done. People seem to think that books are written in like a week and you turn them in like, you know, last week and it gets published and goes out there. And they have their own conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Dylan. He wants to know which historical fact in the Kaiser's Web surprised you the most when you learned about it? The thing that I found in 1944, but I, I can't tell you what it is because give away a novel. <laughs> I mean, That's so, a surprise him too. It is. It's a surprise. And that shocked me. I didn't know that. I, I really did not realize that. And uh, and sure enough, it did. It did happen. Here's a fun fact that won't give away anything in the novel. Uh, when Hitler died in April of 1945, he was the richest man in Europe. He had millions and millions of, of at that point, marks uh, at his, uh, that he had accumulated. Some say billions of marks. He had a lot of money. And when they went to get it after the war, gone. Not a penny. Never found. Never found any of it in any shape, form, or fashion. Now, remember, this is back in the days before computers and the internet. You could actually hide <laughs> things. You could actually take stuff off and get away with it. It was on paper. You could tear paper up and destroy it. There were not, you know, all that. You could actually do that back then. And the guy who was in charge of Hitler's estate was Martin Bormann, which is very interesting. So they never found any of Hitler's wealth. Where'd it go? What, what happened to it? Nobody knows. It, yeah. Nobody knows to this day, but read the Kaiser's Web, you might find out. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions for Steve or Elizabeth or about the process or doing the research? 
They've heard it all. They, they do. <laughs> oh, every, um, oh, somebody wants to know what's the latest book you've read? So I've been reading stuff on the novel I'm writing right now, which is that two th next year's book. So I'm, I've been writing, reading stuff related to that. Uh, I don't want to tell you the subject matter because I want to, don't want anyone to grab it and get it before me. But, uh, but uh, I read, I read, uh, you know, Joe Fender's books. I read uh, uh, Jim Rollins' books. Uh, I read uh, Baldacci and Lee Cha. I read a few thrillers, about five or six thrillers a year, but mostly I read nonfiction. I want to do a book on Romania. We were supposed to go to Romania last year and that got put off. We're going to go, we're going to try next year, but certainly we'll go in 23. Uh, and so uh, the 20, the 2024 novel is going to be about Romania. So I've been reading a lot about Romania lately, getting ready for that and getting that in, into my brain. So uh, mainly I just read that nonfiction mostly. Somebody wants to know your favorite question. Any progress on getting one of your books on the big screen or Netflix or anything like that? Oh, they keep just Disney. It's going to happen. No. I believe it. They called about two weeks ago and said, we are really, we are this close to making a deal right now. We got it all right there. And, uh, and so I, I said, that's wonderful. It's great. Go for it. Let me know when, when you're ready to send a check. You know, when you're ready to send a check. by the phone, running to the mailbox. When you know. it comes, I'm going to get really excited at that point. But who knows? You never know. The problem right now with my stuff is you got to go to Europe to film it. You can't. So, you know, I don't know how they would film anything right now because you literally have to go to Europe. And they're talking about doing the first one would be the Templar legacy. So they would actually do it. You got to go to southern France to film all that. You can't. You can't rebuild Rinslaw Chateau. I guess you could, but it cost a fortune. It'd be easier to go where it already is. But the worst place is to go than southern France when we're not in a pandemic, I have yeah. to say. Yeah, when they when this is over and we'll see how it plays out. But there's there's talk. They I will say they renewed the option. So that is a little bit encouraging. Yeah. yeah, you know, they didn't have to renew the option. They could have said, well, let it lapse and let it go. But they did renew it. And they, not only that, they renewed it twice. So that's interesting, too. So we'll see. I, I'm, she's much more. Uh, it's uh, going to happen. She's much more rosy eyed about that than I am. But I would love to see it come to life. It would be interesting to see how their vision would be of Cotton. Other than you and Elizabeth, who would play the main characters? I have no clue uh, who would do that. They would be whoever they want. They, whoever they want, really. They would be making that decision based on who's available and who would work and what kind of audience that person would bring. There's an infinite amount of people who could who could do it. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to even begin to tell them who. Somebody wants to know how you work on more than one book at a time, it sounds like. Well, I do three at one time, always. Now, I don't write three books at one time. Now, that's not possible. I'm writing the 2022 novel right now. I am researching and outlining 23, and I'm conceptualizing 24. So that's how it works. And then when I'm done with 23, I'm 22, I'll start writing 23, and then I will research and outline ready for 24. I'll conceptualize 25. That's how it works. It goes through. That's the only way I can do a book a year because I need 18 months to put the whole novel together from start to finish. So they overlap one another. And I, I, I have to do it that way. It's the only way to keep on the schedule. And I just learned how to do it. I taught myself how to do that during the 12 years of rejection, you know, in that 12 year rejection period. And so I, I learned how I taught myself how to write a book a year during that time. Well, I'll speak for everybody that we're sorry you got rejected, but it worked out well for us because we get more books out of you that way. So thank you for all those great, was, all those great so rejections. Uh, those, quickly, for those who don't know, from the day I wrote my first word to the day I sold my first word was 12 years. I wrote eight manuscripts during the 12 years. Five went to New York houses, rejected 85 times. I made it the 86th time, 12 years after I started. It's so sad. <laughs> She's not even going to poke you over that one. She's just right. But it put it out in the end, and 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 it came at the right you know time. It'd been great if it happened a little sooner, but it didn't, and that's the way it is. And here we are now, twenty books later, twenty five million books around the world, fifty one countries, fifty two countries, forty one languages. It's pretty amazing. Incredible. So there are a number of people who say, well, not all of us have heard all of your stories. Could you just tell us a story that you think everyone's heard because we haven't heard them? They want a story, a Steve Barry story. What kind of story? What do you think? 
whisper. <laughs> I don't know. They, I mean, there's the Paris story that everybody's heard that one. They've we, heard that. They've heard that one. And the editing story. We we do the edit. We talk about the yeah. editing process with the others. And those are, they may have some new people here, so we'll tell about. The they, they haven't heard your stories. Yes. Yeah. Right. We all love your stories. We'll hear them again. Okay. Well, you know that when I write a novel, uh, I don't tell Elizabeth anything about the book. She knows on the Kaiser's Web right here. She knew it was Martin Borman, World War II, and maybe South Africa and South America. That's it. I don't tell her any plot. I don't tell her characterization, motivations. So what's ooh factor? Nothing. And that's done on purpose so that she's going to have a fresh eye when we need it. So when I'm done with the manuscript, which is an 18 month process, I, I finish it up. I go through it about 50 times. So I'm kind of useless at this point. So I'm done. So she is the first human being to read the book. No one reads the book. And I don't tell my editor or agent much about the book either, to be honest with you. Uh, they don't really, they don't require to be, to be known. They, they trust me to do it and they, they leave it that way. And that's what I do. So I give it to her and she reads it. And Elizabeth is a pretty accomplished editor because she owns a company called 1001 Dark Nights, which uh, with Jillian Stein and MJ Rose, they publish novellas in the romance business. And they do about 40 a year. And they also do books as well, full length books. So she edits all those books. So she's, she's taught herself how to be a pretty good editor. And so I give her the manuscript and she takes it for about four days and she does about 75 to hundred pages a day and stops. She goes through it very slowly and she does it in track changes, at, which is in word and track changes have these little comments that go along the side of the page. So I can talk to him while I'm reading it. I can make a comment. She can write say, a comment. I think that this needs to be strengthened. I don't think that this works. I think, you know, what about this? Don't forget to add this. Now she's being modest here because she not only puts comments, she puts stacks the comments. <laughs> track changes stack. You can put like a hundred on one page. Well, sometimes and, I have a lot to say. Well, you do have a lot to say. <laughs> and she'll put them all down there and they're stacked on top of one another. And you'll look down there. They're different colors. You can see this little rainbow you know, descending in the sky. So I go through all of those uh, changes uh, when she gives it back to me. And I use about 80% of them, maybe closer to 90% of them. There's a few the stylistic changes and things are things that she didn't understand that I, I, I really had it right and she didn't realize it. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, most of them I used. But what she's really looking for is story. So she's reading for story and she's trying to find any flaw in the plot. Like the guy's got a flashlight, the flashlight disappears, it comes back again. Where, where'd it go? Where'd it got to come from? Or you're dead, you're alive, you're dead again, you know? Or a little more importantly than that, not so not so obvious, but like now we're going to go, the, the hero's going to do this, but there was no foreshadowing that there's no motivation. We don't understand why did he make that decision? That makes no sense. With how I left, I left out the yeah. crucible and what yeah. drove him forward. It's it's a flaw. If she finds a flaw that glaring, that is embarrassing, I would literally be like, oh, gosh, I can't believe I did that. She gets purses and shoes, and she gets them from very small <laughs> places, from Chanel or Prada or Louis Vuitton or whatever, because otherwise it would be no incentive on me to get it right if it, you know, if it was just a, just a shoe that we buy somewhere. But she go, she does that. Now, she got a purse with this book. She and did. shoes. Well, I, it was a bonus. But it was a bonus. <laughs> bonus. Uh, she got one last time, but then three books after, the, the, the last three books before that, nothing. That's true. I had three in a row, no flaws. Uh, and sometimes we have a very spirited discussion on the plot. Most flaw. times we have a very spirited discussion. Because... Uh, <laughs> Because so, he doesn't want to say that he's wrong. Well, that's, a, that's not true. I think I'm right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I, you know, I, we there have, you go. <laughs> well, 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 this, no, but this is what will happen is he'll he'll just will argue and we'll argue our point, each of us. Because I want the book to be as, as great as it can be. As yeah, she's not be. trying to prove a point. No, I, I want to, the book to be the best it can possibly be. I mean, this is our livelihood, of course. But he won't, <laughs> he won't actually tell me that I'm right. He'll just come to my office and say, just go buy the purse. And that's, <laughs> that's how he says that. I'm well, right. we had a discussion on this one and I, I, I was not exactly sold that it was a flaw. It was a flaw. I, I, I mean, I really wasn't at first. I had, I said, no, I don't think so. She actually thought I, I omitted something. I needed to put some more in here for something. And that's rare, by the way, that she wants things added. Right. It, it, you know, so, 
I disagreed with it, but after I thought about it for a while, after a very spirited discussion, uh, I realized she was right, and so uh, and so I made the change, and it's and it and it does it does read much better. She's unfortunately she's right most of the time, almost all the time. <laughs> but I heard it. But that is the advantage, though, of a fresh eye. Yeah, that's what she's got that I don't have. So I do argue with her, but I respect what she's saying because she has that fresh eye. Now, my editor, Kelly Raglan, is similar to this. Kelly is a light-handed editor. So when Kelly says something's wrong, yeah. I pay real close attention to it because right. it's obviously really got to her and and she's the same way. And so, you know, you don't want someone It's just everything's wrong. Everything you do is wrong. I mean, you quit listening to them. Yeah. So you pick your battles and both of them do. Uh, Kelly's a lot yeah. nicer than you are, but, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm nice. So what happens just, you know, if you don't know the publishing process, Steve finishes the book, I read the book, I give him my feedback, he makes the changes. Then he sends it to his editor and his agent. They read the book, they give feedback. We're talking story. I mean, this is not a copy edit. This is not about a comma being out of place. This is all about story. Story, story. So editor and agent give feedback, Steve makes those changes. And then when he's really satisfied, he's got the novel like he wants, then it's going to go to the copy editor. Goes to the copy editor, back to Steve. Goes to the copy editor again to go through it one more time, back to Steve. Uh, one thing here, the, with the good work that she does and all the work we do, when I get my copy edits back, I can go through them in an afternoon. Right. I know writers that take two and three weeks to go through yeah. the cut because what they're doing is what we're well, doing. Be done. What we're doing beforehand, yeah. they're doing then. Right. But so that, that's the advantage of getting it done. You right. get much cleaner manuscript. So when that's all done, then it's going to go to the proofreader. The proofreader goes through it, different person than the copy editor, again, because you just want that fresh eye. That's the whole purpose. Proofread comes back to Steve. He accepts it back to the publisher. Then they mock up the book in what's called page proofs. So this is how the book is going to actually look in the final, final copy. So I read those. So I've read she the book twice. It. I read it, you know, right when Steve finishes, and then I read the page proofs. The thing on the page proofs is you have to be very careful because there's something called pagination. Okay. So see here how this chapter ends here. And then this chapter starts here. If we make a change in this chapter, it has to be no longer than that much space because the chapter has to end on this page because they've already laid it'll it change, out. It'll change, it'll change the whole, the, the the whole, whole page thing. Edition. And they charge you for that. And they charge you. They charge you for that. Yeah. I've never had that problem because we've only had one major change, major page proofs, and we all agreed we wanted to modify yes. something in the book. And they, they, of course, said, let's do it. And right. we did it. So, but... You don't want to get to page proofs time and start saying, well, oh, I need to rewrite that yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. I need to rewrite this part right here. I need to, no, you can do it, but they're going to charge you for it right. at that point. I don't want to do that either because by that point, I'm done with the thing. I don't yeah. want to touch it again. Yeah. I want to get But it is our last read to look for it's any, your very typo, last, last any plot problem that doesn't make sense. And a lot of times, Steve can clear something up with one or two sentences. So you go to the end of the chapter, you say, do I have space to do this? If mm -hmm. the answer is yes, he goes back in and he'll, if he has to clear something up that's confusing, he can usually do it in a sentence or two. And we don't change the pagination. But we've that's, had, that's the we've had some uh, readers uh, point out how stupid I am in this book already and with some errors that were made. There are errors made in every book. Every book. And I don't mind that. I, I want you to tell me those errors because I'm going to uh, take those changes and make those changes in the next edition. Absolutely. So if you find an error in the book, please send it to Just me. Just don't call him stupid. Just don't call me an idiot and right. that. How it, so I mean, mean they, they, they literally write a book right to me and say, I was reading the book and on page 380, you, you had a, a, you misspelled the word. It just completely threw me out of the book. I can't believe that you would have an entirely misspelled word. How stupid and are you? you? Have no more than a kindergarten. Yeah, education. I mean, obviously you're not very bright because you right. can't find. You know, you can't get yeah. that done. And and you want to write back to him and say, are you out of your mind? I mean, right. you know, you write a hundred and ten thousand words and right. give it to me, and I guarantee you, I'll find a misspelled word. Yeah. So somewhere. please send the mistakes. Just don't call him. You know, a kindergarten yeah. education. <laughs> well, I, well, what I've started doing, and I've done this recently, is I write back and I say, I appreciate you sending me that. And I appreciate you pointing out the error. I love to know those. I want to fix it. What I don't understand is why you had to be rude and mean when you pointed it out to me. You know, writers are people, too. We have feelings as well. You know, and, you know, just 
why? Why do you have to do that? Please don't do that. But they all write back and apologize. Yeah, we well, get an apology back then, and then we make a friend, and that's fine. And that's the way it should be. They just should. Be, you got to watch what you say. People are people, and they have feelings too. Yeah. So that's the whole process, and that was a good story. That was yeah, good. that was a good one. Yeah. I don't remember that story. So see, I you know, it's always right. nice to get new stories. Yeah. You have lots of just love coming in that I just want to share with you before we let you go. People love the Bishop's Pawn. It's their favorite story. How'd you come up with that? We, we you know, I'm in Houston, met Murder by the Book, and I love Cotton. Please don't retire him. Are you going to get rid of him? Oh, no, so, no. He's just going to take a year off. It's him. All. Yeah, no, <laughs> him. no. They just wanted to try something new to bring me over to a new publisher to, to get the accounts excited. And that's fine. But, you know, Cotton will be back in 23 and 24. No problem. Mm -hmm. And because I know you value not being poked both on screen and off, I think I know the answer to this question. It says, my wife wants to know, with today being International Women's Day, who is the woman who has inspired you? <laughs> I had to read it. It was there. But, you know. But I think, you know, actually. Ask the answer. Yeah. Steve won't say this because, um, he, you know, he's so modest about it. But what I love about the books and the man, but especially how he crafts the books, if you'll notice, and your bookmark people know this. There are always strong women in Steve's books. He never, ever writes weak women. He appreciates and admires women so much. And so whether they're the antagonist. All or the women the, are that way. Uh, right. Whether they're, they're the antagonist or protagonist or a secondary character, he always writes strong women. I'm, and they, I'm surrounded by them. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I had a law office for years. You know, they were they were all strong and tough. And, yeah. And I have, you know, two daughters the same way. So I'm, I'm surrounded by them. And so I, that's the characterization. And all my women are very assertive and strong. And one day we do the novellas with MJ Rose, you know, for Cassiopeia. And we're doing another one, by the way, this July uh, called The End of Forever. So there's another one where we're exploring Cassiopeia more. It loved, I'd love Cassiopeia to have her own book one day. It'd be great. Yeah. So all the women. We really, we really appreciate your coming by and sharing your home with us your new home what a treat you know that's an extra treat that we wouldn't get so thank you for your for your tour and all the extra little goodies and information we miss you terribly everybody you know the love that's pouring in they just we all just miss you and you know it's just a product of the pandemic that we're all struggling through but it's a good reminder and it's nice to see your smiling faces and um i just look forward to <laughs> yeah we miss you guys yes. hopefully we'll be back on the road next year and we'll uh I said I may not ever come back, but you never know. We might just pop back in. We miss you too much. We might have to come back. We just might have well, to. We would love that. You're you're always welcome. We love you, and there's lots of there's lots of people out here who love you. So, love thank you, Thanks. Stay so safe. Bye bye. You Take too. Care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.